Today, I'm going to be sharing my new rake brushes and giving you some tips on how and when you should use these. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind Lockery Fine Art. If you are unfamiliar with rake brushes, your standard filbert, and for me, when I go with rake brushes, I like filberts way more than flats. Flats, they're too uniform and it's hard, and we'll talk about that later, but it's very hard to hide the fact that you used a rake brush with a flat, sort of harder, I should say. But what a rake brush is, you've got your typical filbert, which would be your hand like, there's your filbert, depending on how your fingers are shaped. If your fingers are flat, then your, is not, your, your hand is not a filbert. My hand's a filbert. So, kind, well, I guess it's angled. Move along, Lisa. So, we'll pretend this is a filbert. For a rake brush, there's your rake brush. So one brush stroke, you get a whole bunch of little brush strokes in between, and that's, that's all a rake is. Now the thing with rake brushes that we need to watch is it is very easy to make things too uniform and look very fake. They're really handy for painting fur, for painting feathers, as long as you don't overdo it with these brushes. So let's go ahead and take a look at how well these specific brushes work, and I'll have links to those in the video description. I've not used them yet, I bought them from Amazon, we'll see. And then I'm gonna demonstrate what happens when you use these right versus less right. For this demonstration, I'm going to be using a Frederick's canvas pad. And just for transparency, I am sponsored by Frederick's. They did provide me with this canvas pad, but it's the product I would have recommended either way. So there you go. What it is is a, sheet, a pad like you would have a paper. It has 10 sheets of canvas that's already gessoed, ready to paint on. I personally use these for practicing little techniques or doing small demonstrations. I don't use these myself for completing full paintings. I prefer my canvas boards and stretch canvases, but you could do full paintings on these if you wanted to. Anyway, that is not what this video is for. So I am going to try first the larger brush. Now the thing with a rake brush is you have to have the right balance of water versus paint. Too much of either and it will work more like a filbert and we'll show you that here. If I've got thick paint on, it just looks like a regular filbert. The brush stroke doesn't have that those little lines that we would want a rake brush for. So if I wipe some of that off, we'll add a little bit more water here. That will give me a nicer balance and don't apply very much pressure. And now we're getting those tiny lines, a whole bunch of tiny lines. Actually, this brush, I'm kind of impressed with. I am liking the results I'm getting with this one. I wasn't sure, I usually use the low Cornell rake brushes, but I can't find them anymore. So I went looking for an alternative, which is what led to this video, adding a little bit more water and that is giving us really, really nice lines there. So as we go in through this, you can see right there on the bristles where they're separated. And that is how you get these nice whole bunch of lines in one brush stroke. Again, you push too hard and now it just looks like your typical filbert. So you have to thin that paint with water to get a good flow here. I'm really, really happy with this brush. So let's rinse that brush out. I wanna try some of the smaller brushes. That one was the half inch. This one is the quarter. So still thinning that with water. This is a really nice brush. I am so happy with the results that we're getting here. And then we've got an eighth inch. Let's go ahead and test. I'm sure that'll be fine, but we'll test it anyway. For tiny little areas, I could have used this on my recent sea otter. There we go, little areas there. Now the last brush I wanna test, this one was a different brand. This is the Ruby Silver Satin Filbert Grass Comb. You'll have these named several things. Rake brushes would always call them, but sometimes they will be called grass brushes or fur brushes. Yep, that one's fine too. I definitely could recommend every single one of these. And one of the things that I'm liking on this is the, these bristles are separating really nicely. See how separated those bristles are? That is what you want when you're using a rake brush. When these brushes are new, they have a tendency, at least the low, and cor low Cornell ones, they stayed together too much and it made it a little bit harder to use when they were new. I usually needed to let those brushes get damaged first so that they started to fray even more and that's how I got them to work well. So if you do have a rake brush that's a different brand, this one is the King Art, but if you have another brush that is a different brand, you may just need to let it get kind of dirty. Don't, I mean, rinse it with water, but don't rinse it with your brush conditioners or cleaners because that might take longer for the brush to work well. And I definitely, with the low Cornell brushes, found that it always took me a lot longer to get them to where I got this kind of result so early on. So I'm really happy 
with, with these brushes, surprisingly so. Next, I wanna talk about when to and not to use these or how to use these. The big thing with these brushes is I feel it works better if you mix them with your regular liner or a round brush. So here is my round, here is my liner brush. These brushes are, are great in combination with your rake brushes. If you only use the rake brush, it's too easy to have something that looks a bit too uniform. So let's say we have a tiger. As we put the fur in there, we don't want to make the same brush stroke again and again and again. It will look, and this is actually too thick, wipe some of that off. It will look too uniform. So we start building up those brush strokes and I'm slightly twisting and turning the brush and creating clumps and clusters. And that's the thing when you're painting fur, same thing with grass. Everything is going to be formed in clumps and clusters and it is very important. Oh, that paint's still wet. It's very important to get variation in there. If everything is uniform, you make one brush stroke and you're like, wow, that, that really looks like fur. Don't just repeat the exact same brush stroke everywhere. You're not going to get the results that you want. It's going to look very, very fake. So what we want to do is make sure to twist and turn that brush as we build that up. So let's add a little bit more. And see how it looks, starts looking like fur where the, where the bristles separate. As I pull that, look at those nice frayed edges. So it starts to look like fur, but again, clump and cluster those. We can pull some of the dark in there right up against it. That has a little too much water, so I need to dab that on my paper towel. There we go. And see how I'm starting to twist the brush? So I'm holding it at one angle and twisting and turning as I pull out. So it starts as a thicker brush stroke. Let's do that over the white so it's more obvious. But we're starting with a thicker brush stroke and twisting it as we move. Now you're not just going to repeat that same brush stroke again and again. Switch it the other direction. Get those clumps and clusters in there. Now when I paint fur, when I'm looking at my reference photo, I'm not trying to paint fur to where everything looks exactly like the photo, but I do want to follow the general direction of the fur, the width and length of each of those bits of fur. But I don't need to sit there with a liner brush and draw in every individual strand. That's not going to look very realistic. But we are going to switch over to the liner brush when we want to define this a bit better. Liner brush or a round brush, depends on the size you're working on and how thin you need that line. But I can come back through and define a few of these. And this step is very important when you're using a rake brush to make that rake brush, to get the, that natural feel, this step needs to be followed. You're not going to typically want to do everything with just the rake brush. You're probably not going to get the results that you really want. I wanna come through and just add a few more. So that rake brush will save me a lot of time for those base layers, but see how I can now come in and define even more with those bits of fur. And they're still clumped and clustered together. So see how I start forming the clumps a little bit better? And then grass is going to be the same thing. You don't want it too uniform. Grass is gonna be the same thing. We do not want it to be too uniform. So I'm just gonna start with a base of black and we can come through and actually let's add a little bit of white to that because that is not showing up well enough. Adding the white will make it more opaque. But as we start building these wispy sections of the grass, I need to make sure that there is variation. See how we'll move that going another way come back the opposite direction. And just like fur, we wanna have this more clump and clustered together. So you're not just doing the same line again and again. It starts to look man-made, it starts to look too uniform. We wanna make sure that we're getting that variation. And usually when I use this brush, I push a little bit harder at the beginning of the brush stroke and lift the brush away from the canvas at the end of the brush stroke. So that is a very important part of getting that, that thicker base Thinning out at the end gives it a nice natural feel. I am so impressed with this brush. This is so much better than the low Cornell brushes that I had used. My low Cornell brushes were a little bit too soft when I got them and so they just would not have given me this, uh, this great, like this feels to me like a brush that I've really broken in and it's already, wow, I'm, I'm kind of impressed. 
I was not expecting that. So as we start doing this, I want to start overlapping a bit. And again, twist and turn. So like here, I'm holding the brush to the side, getting these longer brush strokes there, letting them overlap some. Now we're going to rinse that brush. I'm going to come on top with highlights. So even with this brush, it's not just a one layer and you're done. Same thing for grass, doesn't matter. Like always, we'll be doing everything in many layers. So let's go ahead and get a few highlights coming on the tops of these. Oh, I need a little bit more water that was not really showing up. And so the solution in that case was, there we go, almost too much water. So we start hitting the tops of some of them, not all of them. Like always, when it comes to anything with nature, whether it be fur, grass, bushes, we always want to get that variation in there. Now this demonstration is not creating the most realistic grass. It just shows you how we would use this brush in order to do it and what to avoid, like creating too much of the same brush stroke again and again. And that, see, twisting that brush, do it a little bit slower so you can see how I'm doing that. I'm twisting as I move up, get that variation in there. Now let's pretend you got this all built up the way that you wanted. Your next step would be to take your round brush or a liner brush, ideally not drop it like I do. And we're gonna go ahead and add a few additional wisps, just like we did with the fur. You want to define a few of these so it breaks up if you were inevitably I would say almost, almost always you're going to end up with at least a little bit too uniform. That's what you're gonna fix with this brush when you come through with the round or the liner and do a few individuals. Now that's not to say that you can't end up too uniform when using these brushes or the round and the liner, but using a bigger variety of brushes like this is going to give you a bigger variety in some of those brush strokes, which can look more natural. So you're just hitting a few of those. Again, when you load that brush, you don't, you want to make sure you're thinning that paint out with a bit of water and then oh, even a bit more water. And then just barely letting it touch the canvas. Now, another quick tip with this is that if you are using a canvas that has too much tooth, it's too rough, this is going to be very hard. This is very similar to what you would want with a liner brush where a smooth canvas is going to give you smoother results. I use this brush quite often for grass, fur, and feathers to get just that frayed edge. And I use it more as a base for my liner and round brush. Before we wrap this up, we've got some semi exciting news. Semi, because I already told some of you on a live stream, but Derwent sent me their new Chromaflow pencil, so we'll be giving these a try next week. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. Also click on the bell notification icon so you're more likely for YouTube to notify you when I do have a new video go up. And I've also got an email newsletter that if all else fails, will let you know once a week whatever new videos I had go live and what live streams are coming up that week.